Well, great. I'm back. Yeah. So, so share with us what got you into this back in the beginning. I think you, like myself, had a, had a powerful story. You had your own powerful story, as I did, but you have a story with one of your children that was very powerful. You mind sharing, yeah. sharing that? Oh, absolutely. I'd, I'd be honored to share that. Uh, I was kind of floundering what I, what I actually wanted to do with my life. Do I want to be a medical doctor? Do I want to be a businessman? Do I want to... I, I kind of said, ah, geez, I'm afraid of chemistry. I, <laughs> I didn't want to... I didn't want to deal with calculus and then deal with chemistry and, and all this stuff. And, and uh, literally I was doing everything but what I needed to do to become a doctor. So I said, well, I'm going to take some business courses. So I, I've always, I've been a, in a parallel business uh, and healthcare from the beginning of college. I actually started out in aeronautical engineering, believe it or not, uh, because I wanted to fly jets. That is but uh, discovering discovering that I had uh, color blindness for red and green, not completely, but enough to disqualify me for jets. Wow. And I thought, well, you know what? <laughs> I want to fly an F-16. I want to be Tom Cruise. <laughs> and uh, so that dream evaporated and I, I left the, uh, the, the ROTC program that I was in at Arizona State University and then switched over to pre-med. So I thought, okay, if I study pre-med, then I've, I can go into different areas and decide what I want to do. So I went back and studied in Connecticut and, and I was running on the track team at the time. And I was coming home from a track meet in my car, I stopped at a red light and out of nowhere, I got nailed from behind. Well, out of nowhere, no, from behind, I got mm. nailed by a, a drunk driver. He was either drunk or had fallen asleep at the wheel. But all I know is I went back in my chair. And next thing you know, I'm waking up in the back of an ambulance. So uh, I couldn't breathe. And I, and I really could not breathe. And so they took me to the hospital. Thank goodness, no fractures. Um, did evaluations, gave me anti-inflammatory drugs and sent me home. Well, I couldn't breathe for this week. A week went on and two weeks went by and I still couldn't breathe. And my father, who goes to a chiropractor when his low back goes out, said, why don't you go to this chiropractor, my chiropractor? So he took me up there. And the chiropractor explained to me uh, the connection between my cervical spine and my diaphragm. Well, I, I've studied a lot of anatomy, but for whatever reason, I never made that connection uh, consciously that the cervical spine would have anything to do with my ability to breathe. Well, he explained that to me, pointed it out quite simply. Uh, and then he said, I'm going to do something to you called an adjustment. And an adjustment is re putting a vertebrae back in place that isn't moving the way it should, and he restored proper mobility and alignment of that vertebrae. So he laid me down on the table, I'm relaxing, puts his hands on my neck, and adjusts me very gentle, very quick, uh, very smooth. Uh, it clicked, you know, kind of like cracking your knuckles, no big deal. Uh, and I could take a deep breath for the first time. In two weeks, I just went, <sighs> and so, I don't know if I got scared by the cracking, not really, I was very calm, but I took this huge breath and I felt this amazing relief and that inspired me to change my, my direction. I said, what did, you, what did you do and can I hang out with you? So I hung out with this guy uh, for a few months uh, and helped him out in his clinic. At the time I was paying my way through school as a massage therapist and so he sent me all these uh, whiplash cases and so I treated the, the soft tissue injuries of people as a massage therapist when I was going to school. And so that got me on this track for, for chiropractic. Um, so let's fast forward several years. So I, I ended up going to chiropractic school in, in 89. Uh, actually, January 1990 is when the semester started officially. And uh, then let's fast forward again to 1994. School's already done. I've already done a year of practice uh, uh, in private practice with a group that I didn't like the, the way it was done in America. And I thought I would try something different and move to Europe. And that's a whole other story. But anyway, my son, Christopher, uh, was born as an emergency C-section. Uh, during the, the C-section, my wife was having a negative response to the anesthesia. I uh, started going into shivers. And uh, I'm standing outside in scrubs and ready to go in at any time because at the time they don't allow you in the emergency, in the, the delivery room uh, because it was considered an emergency. 
Uh, if it were pre-planned, I could have probably been present, but in this case, I couldn't. But anyway, uh, I saw a scared look on the, on the faces of the nurses that were taking care of my son, um, and they couldn't get him to breathe. They were doing the suction tube down his mouth, and they couldn't get him to breathe. Uh, he was flaccid. He was blue. And uh, if I, I can't tell this story without crying, but I'll, I'll try now. But anyway, uh, whatever force it was, God, perhaps, or some energy, pushed me through those doors. And I said, please give me my son. I didn't speak much Portuguese at the time, only been in country for a few months. And uh, picked up Christopher, held him in my hands, and looked at his tiny little, tiny little guy, and we just started wiggling his atlas. And as I wiggled his atlas, he just took this huge breath and arched his back, and all this color came back into his body. And I went, thank you, God. You know, thank you, Jesus, because it was the most impactful experience in my life chiropractically, that chiropractic literally saved his life, literally turned on his life force. He wasn't suffering from pain. He was dying from not breathing lack of yeah. oxygen to his body. And by adjusting his atlas that just kicked in his nervous system, relieved whatever pressure was on his brain stem, and it allowed his breathing apparatus to activate it. And, and that just changed my whole conviction for chiropractic. And, oh, and so I, from that day forward, chiropractic for me is saving lives. It's not about just treating pain. So even though people only come to the chiropractor when they're in pain, that's all they can understand at the time. But it's an opportunity to get them in and educate them. So that, that's what got me into chiropractic was first, it saved my life, literally, because you can't run track and not breathe at the same time. Right. And uh, it, it saved my son's life. And so that inspires me every day when I pray in the morning, when I meditate in the morning. It's, it's thank you, Lord, for, for this privilege to do what I do every day mm -hmm. and to the honor to put your hands on people and, and know that you're saving their life on some level. Maybe it's not as radical, as extreme as my son's case, but every time I treat somebody, I remember that and I think of the impact that we're having. And then when I, when I hear them whining about their pain that they've had for 20 years and they're only coming to me now, it's like, you know, be quiet. <laughs> we're, we're having a much greater impact on your health and nervous system than this pain. Yeah. Uh, but pain is what people understand. So that, that's really, that's my story. That's what got me. Oh, that's fascinating. Here. And just for the listeners that, that don't know, the atlas is the first bone in the neck and the brainstem drops down in that. Yeah, so that was, oh, what a beautiful story. What a beautiful experience to have to, to anchor your faith, confidence, and belief in what you're doing to help people. And I love how, you've, how you phrase that where you're saving lives on some level, whether they realize it or not. That's, that's powerful. Yeah, we really are in a beautiful profession, a very misunderstood profession, but it's a beautiful, beautiful profession. It's a mission, Dr. J. It's, it really isn't is. a, it's not a job. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not a career. It, it's a mission. If, if, you, if you take it on the way I know you practice and the way I practice, and if you take it on as a mission uh, to save lives, literally, if, you, if you're decreasing the use of anti-inflammatory drugs, getting them off, just anti-inflammatory drugs killed more than 10,000 people every year. So if, mm. if you're getting them off painkillers, look at the opioid addiction in America. Why is America the only, planet, the only place on the planet with this severe opioid addiction? Perhaps because 90% of the opioids are sold in America. Yeah. And that's because of marketing. It's because of a, a very uh, imbalanced society that, that, that really needs some healing. Because why else would their citizens be reaching out and, and being getting hooked on heroin, basically? It's, that's all this is. Opioids is heroin. Yeah. No matter what you call the form, the impact on the nervous system, the addictive results are the same. So we, we can avoid heroin addiction. We can help people with these things. So you are saving lives. You're literally saving a life when, when you get this, not only immune system, but getting people off drugs, avoiding surgery. So if you can avoid a surgery, you're, you're having a tremendous impact on their life. And remember this, Dr. J, as you, as you know, uh, any chiropractor out there that's listening, you know, it, it, again, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. So if there's mom's not happy in the house, you take care of mom, you've just helped that whole family heal, not just mom, low back pain. Mom couldn't do what she normally needs to do every day. She can't pick the kids up and kiss them and hug them because of her back pain. Now you got you, that healed because you knew how to put the things in place to allow the body to heal itself. And now that mom has a better quality of life. So you've just impacted an entire family. So if you multiply that times the thousands of families that you're helping, 
it's, it's quite incredible the impact yes. that, that we can have on, on humanity. And I, and I really wish that the politicians weren't <laughs> so much involved in policy making because yeah. it, it all comes down to money and who runs that as pharmaceuticals. And, and that's very sad. So yeah. I'm sorry to diverge a bit, but no, that's you, good. Know, you know that I've, I'm trying, I've been trying to launch this uh, on-site clinic concept in the United States called MSK Health. And one of the barriers to entry that I found is that these on-site clinic provider, provider companies, there's thousands of them, they have a perverse incentive to sell uh, generic drugs at a tremendous margin. So yes. when I went in and said, you know, I can reduce the dependency on painkillers, they literally laughed in my face like, why would you want to do that? That's where we make all our money. I said, oh my God, I really am an idiot because I want to help people not be dependent on drugs. Their whole focus is sell as many drugs as you possibly can in these on-site clinics to increase their margins. And so, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's, it's a huge barrier to entry because we don't have a health system, Dr. James. You know, we, we have a sickness system and it's sick on many levels, not just uh, the fact that you have to be sick before a doctor will see you, but it's sick in its mentality, reactivity, as you stated in the beginning, it's reactive care, not preventive care. And it's mm -hmm. totally profit driven and not, uh, not mission driven, not with the, the purpose of humanity involved at all. It's, it's really quite perverse and very disappointing that uh, chiropractors who, who dedicate their lives to humanity, uh, it's like watching fake news, you know, you can't, that someone's doing the right thing, they're doing something good, but it doesn't follow the mainstream uh, line that they're, they're talking about. And they'll, they'll call you all sorts of names because you're not following their, whatever it is they're talking about at the time. Right, right. So sorry about that, that divergence, but do you want me to shut my video off now? Yeah, yeah let's do that because we're, we're getting we're some getting... information on low bandwidth. So let's, you shared with us about yourself, how you got into chiropractic and helping people naturally. You shared with us how you've really taken this next level to help on a corporate level of bringing chiropractic and properly functioning spine and nervous system into the workplace. You've, you've shared with us the power of your son's story and literally saving his life at, when he was born and wasn't breathing. What are some of your favorite uh, stories outside of, of those or, or favorite tools in your toolbox to use to help your community and, and society? Well, there, there's, there's two things there. I mean, one is the tools that I use and the second would be perhaps my favorite stories. There's a lot of stories. I mean, we all have hundreds of them. Yeah. But I'd say my favorite tool are my two hands and my communication skills. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that's the most important things for us as chiropractors is we need to educate, educate, educate. And, uh, that, that's the most important thing. But uh, as far as the tools in the toolbox, I'd say besides education, it's just, we get great results. Uh, and we have, to, we have to carry people through the process. They have to understand that healing is a process um, and that it takes time. That, you know, you didn't get sick in one day. <laughs> it took 20, 30 years or more before you came and saw me. So. Uh, I might be good, but I'm not God, and <laughs> take time, right? So, right. well, do you use technology? I, a, uh, do you use technology on site, or do you use your hands on site and in your offices? What What are you using for the most part? We use both. We we use a uh, a multiple percussion instrument uh, designed by Sigma Instruments, and we find that's very effective because one, it's very soft; it doesn't allow there's no manipulation involved. Um, you scan vertebra per vertebrae and check the mobility and the fixation and the range of motion basically of each vertebral segment uh, and how it's moving and then you can adjust it gently with multiple impulses and then you could rescan and do a comparison of how if you've made a difference or not and so you get instant feedback that is that is objective rather than subjective not oh i don't i'm not feeling any better you know but you know your vertebrae are moving better according to this instrument and it's a highly sensitive instrument that's uh, known as a piezoelectric sensor that is the same type of technology used by nasa to test the integrity of the for example the 
the heat tiles on the space shuttle or to test rivets on, on uh, aircraft, fighter jets, etc. cetera. So uh, it tests something beyond our own perception of, for example, uh, manual palpation. So most of us as chiropractors rely on manual palpation of vertebral segments to see how they're moving through their proper ranges of motion. Well, this does it to a much finer level and you can see to what degree the, the vertebrae is moving or not moving and how much fixation there is or how much resistance there is. And then you can introduce a gentle impulse and then reevaluate and see if you had a positive impact. So we do that and we combine techniques. So we combine a traditional chiropractic care, but we evaluate every patient using this technology uh, because if, if some people have resistance or fear associated with the popping sound that comes with an adjustment sometimes or most of the time, it's called cavitation, uh, then we have this option as well, but everyone gets treated with that first. And I would say that technology doesn't replace your hands, absolutely not. But it does give you this very accurate, um, objective view of what's going on in there. And sometimes you will need to use your hands to do additional work or therapy or, or myofascial work. But most of the times in the corporate setting, we, we are focused about 90 about 90 percent is purely using this instrumentation when it's very fast it's very accurate it's easy not it's what was the word i wanted to use was uh again i'm thinking in portuguese but uh it's very reliable between doctors various doctors so if you do the scan and i do the scan and, and 10 other doctors who are well trained in the technique do the scan you'll get very similar results each time and whereas, whereas chiropractors each have a very different touch. Uh, one, one might be heavy handed, one might be too light, one might be super light. Uh, and the, the touch and the feel is very different, but using instrumentation allows a standardization between physicians. So I can rotate my doctors if a doctor needs to go out or travel. Like I often, I travel a lot, speak around the world. So uh, I need people to cover my patients. So mm -hmm. if they're using instrumentation, there's not this huge difference between the doctor's touch, technically. Um, but yeah, that's basically what we use. And then we add exercise programs and, and uh, we educate them on nutrition. Uh, we make the connection between all this thing, proper, proper nervous system function, proper nutrition, proper exercise, stretching, posture. Uh, that's all part of that corporate package. And with every patient that comes through the clinic, basically. And what's fascinating with that, your corporate package, and the things you just listed are all directly related to strengthening or weakening our immune system. Absolutely. So they, they, we bring it back to that immune immunity again. So yeah, stress, posture, um, subluxations or pinched nerves to the, the immune system. Um, anyway, and then nutrition, as you, as you wrote up, they're all so important for our, our health and immunity. Right. Yeah, and, and, and that's again, that's why I, I said the most important tool in the toolbox is education, education, education. Yeah. And, and to go back to like favorite stories, mm -hmm. you know, of course, my son is the best story in the world. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. That's Christopher. But, you know, throughout the years, there, there was this one little guy, uh, for whatever reason, it was, I think he was, I don't know, he was five years old, but his bladder was not functioning, it wasn't expanding correctly. And so the poor little guy had to pee all the time or he had to wear a diaper, still at five, he didn't have bladder control or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And they were doing sonograms and showed that his bladder basically, the bladder muscle itself had basically deflated. They wanted to do surgery and put some type of, I, I don't know what the surgery was, but the way the mother explained it was it's some kind of mesh or something to kind of mm -hmm. open up the bladder to allow for more, more volume. But it would have had, it would have, been a major surgery to a five-year-old little boy mm -hmm. uh, so she was afraid of that thank goodness she was because we started treating him and, and just adjusting his low back aligning his pelvis and um there wasn't any didn't really have a cause for it it was idiopathic dysfunction of the bladder um there wasn't any pathology organic or otherwise that, that any doctors had found but under chiropractic care we just aligned his his pelvis and his little back and it adjusted him. And within a, a couple of weeks, he had full function of his bladder. And they, they uh, went back to do the, the sonograms. They call it echographia. Uh -huh. So echogram, uh, they do in Portugal. And he had full restoration of bladder size and function and no need for surgery. That was wonderful. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, that is wonderful. It was another, another, yeah, it was, it was great. The mom was happy. Yeah, I bet. Uh, so, you know, we improved the quality of life of that little boy. You know, you know, Jay, you and I, we take so many of these things for granted. Mm-hmm. We take for granted the amazing things we do every single day. And we don't even realize we're doing stuff that people are desperate for. People yeah. need so much. Yeah. And, and they're not getting it. And they're taking drugs and they're getting surgery and all this stuff because they don't understand that there's an alternative to that. Yes. Uh, and I'm grateful we have those one. things. I'm, I'm grateful we have yeah. certain pharmaceutical things when we're, when we're desperate and really need this. I'm grateful we have surgery. But we should always try the less aggressive stuff first. And unfortunately, people don't yeah. understand those options. Well, it's about function. And so mm-hmm. I think we need to focus on function and not symptomatology. So, it, it, you know, <laughs> you know, the old analogies, we always, chiropractors are famous for using analogies. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, uh, you got a vibration in your steering wheel. Do you, do you dampen that with pillows? Do you remove the steering wheel and put a new one on? Do you treat that steering wheel? Or do you find out what's causing that vibration in the steering wheel? You know, it's a, mm-hmm. oh, wow, it's an alignment. And then you say, oh, wow, look at that bad alignment in the tire. It's all worn out. Let's just take that tire off and put a new one on. Yeah. That's disc surgery, right? Right. So, but they never realigned the vertebrae or restored function to it that caused the hernia in the first place. Mm-hmm. So now they've just caught us a bigger problem that's going to blow out in the segment above or below in four or five years. Mm-hmm. So the chiropractor looks at that and says, you know what? This is an alignment functional problem. So let's restore function to this vertebrae. And if the hernia is not so bad, it may just heal itself, which we see thousands of every year. Right. Um, and so the vibration automatically miraculously went away. That vibration of the steering wheel also went mm-hmm. away when you aligned the front wheel. What does the front wheel have to do with my steering wheel? Nothing at all. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's kind of like, why do I have neck pain? You know, it, oh, it's my ankle that's out. <laughs> why, my hand is numb. What does that have to do with my neck? Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, we have to use these analogies. So, you know, I know I get off path because I'm, I'm very passionate about what we do every no, day I and I love what I do every day. But this, this one story that really jumps out was this lady. She was about, I don't know if she was 48 ish, 50 at the time. And mm-hmm. she was on the heart transplant list and she had been on a heart transplant list for several years, uh, waiting for the proper match uh, and whatnot. And in, in the meantime, she was on, she was on a lot of medications and wearing some kind of, device, I don't know, not exactly a pacemaker, but something different. I'm not a cardiologist to, to, to be able to explain what she was doing at the time. And this was in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just did her under, just took care of her under normal chiropractic care. She didn't have any really severe pain or symptoms. We just, she had very bad posture. So she had really bad forward head carriage. Mm-hmm. She had a very big kyphosis, which is that excessive curve in the dorsal spine. Mm-hmm. And so we logically look at that. That's a lot of pressure on the nerves that feed the heart. Yeah. You know, the, the nerves of the lower neck, the C7, and the mm-hmm. dorsal spine, T1, T2. Those are direct line electrical circuits to the heart muscles. And if your head is forward, that's putting a stress and a strain and a stretch on those nerves. So our logic says take the pressure off and see what happens. So I don't go in there and say, oh, I'm going to fix her heart. I say, I'm going to correct her posture and re- remove interference from the nerves that are connected to her heart. Well, geez, what a coincidence. Within six months of care, Jay, she was off the, la- the waiting list because the doctor said her heart valve function had improved and the, the wow. uh, chambers of her heart were functioning correctly uh, to the point where she was no longer on the waiting list for a heart transplant. So she still was on some medications and whatnot, but no need for the transplant. She's walking. She's going, doing stairs and walking regularly. She's healthier now than she was uh, 10 years prior. Wow. What a powerful story of the power of, of that visceral somatic you were talking about earlier and proper function and biomechanics that then affect organ function. And it's just, it's so amazing what we do. I just love what we do. <laughs> it's, it's all interrelated, Dr. J. And, yeah. and it's just the way it is. And, and <laughs> we tend to compartmentalize everything. There's, everyone's mm. a specialist in their own area. And they forget that these are human beings, not systems that we're treating. Correct. These are human beings. And for this human being to function, all systems need to function. So, mm-hmm. and what controls all those systems is the nervous system. Mm-hmm. And uh, unless we can function, it was BJ Palmer that used the, the uh, analogy of the watch. You know, you, the watch doesn't function better by removing pieces of the, the watch, <laughs> you know, removing yeah. gears. 
Right. You correct the alignment of the gears and that watch will work perfectly well. Oh, great so, example. Great example. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you something since this uh, series, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. This series is focusing on health and immunity. I think we've covered all that really well. But you've got a perspective that many of us don't have. So, And I, I experienced this when I went over there to practice in Portugal for a few years. Being a, a physician in America and living in, quote, unquote, the American bubble and what the information that were just just dumped on us all day, every day from TV and news and such. It's, it's a different perspective outside of the U S than here. If you could just help give us a little, uh, that outsider perspective to help us with, with where you mentioned that we're so drug focused, is it different in Europe than here where, there's a pill or a potion for everything. And like you pointed out, there's just so much money to be made in that industry that that seems to be the driving factor in what, what's used at work or to, Oh, I've got this headache. Let me just take this pill to get rid of the headache to go rather than fixing the phone. Yeah. What, what is your perspective on the outside of America looking in? Well, un unfortunately, Dr. J, I would say that that is the paradigm globally. Okay. And that's driven by the pharmaceutical industry. The difference, the tremendous difference is who's paying the bills. Yeah. So in this social socialist republic is what it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, socialist democratic republic. So it's not communism. And it's not socialism, but it's called the socialist democratic republic mm -hmm. uh, where there are tremendous freedoms. But they do have... Uh, what's the term you guys use? It's a type of healthcare for all. Um, Oh. We have social medicine. So yeah, that that's they, true, social medicine. Like the, the England has the NHS, National Healthcare System. Your, uh, Portugal has the SNS, mm -hmm. um, Sistema Nacional de Saúde, which is the, the na national health system. And the government pays for all health care. Unless you have private insurance, you can, you, every citizen in Portugal has the right to health care. So they, the hospitals pay for for everything. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have private insurance, then you can get private health care. It's not to say one's better than the other. We, you know, we've been to, we've been to, I know people, like for example, our, our daughter was kicked in the face by a horse and her face was, was crushed, literally. Ooh. That's Joanne. I don't know if you've ever yes. met Joanne. Yeah, I have. And you weren't here at the time. This happened around 210. And uh, her face was crushed. And thank God for the national healthcare system because mm -hmm. she had multiple operations mm -hmm. that would have probably in the U.S. bankrupted the family, would have been mm -hmm. in the millions perhaps. Wow. There's multiple facial reconstructive surgeries. We're talking screws and pins and you name it. She mm -hmm. looks beautiful today. You never know that she had uh, the accident that she had, but the national healthcare system paid every penny of it. And that would have bankrupt just any other family. Wow. So that, that's a huge difference. Yeah. So that... I would say that's the greatest difference is that uh, the government pays for that health care. As far as the attitude towards medications and drugs, I'd say that just, there's no, you can't advertise medications in Portugal or in Europe. So it's not like America, I sit in my hotel room between, you know, between conferences or whatever. Every commercial that comes on is yeah. a pill for this and a pill for that and a pill and a pill and a pill. Yeah. And it seems like they invent diseases and then they, they produce the pill to sell that disease. You know, it's like, yes. so you don't have that issue here. So they're not allowed to market drugs. So they're not, there's no advertising about drugs, which is a tremendous relief because every time I go to America, I'm just blown away that every advertisement is some pill, potion, or lotion. Yes. And uh, that's not allowed here. Well, it's I understand so that it's not allowed anywhere. Different. I understand it's not allowed in any country except the U S and, um, What's next to Australia there? New Zealand. Yeah. So the U.S. and New Zealand are the only countries that, that's, that Big Farm is allowed to market to the end user. And we're the two countries with the biggest drug problems. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's sad, Jay, but it's perverse. It, it, it's, uh, there are perverse incentives, and it's all about money, yeah. unfortunately. And it, it comes down to money. Uh, well, with, let me ask you this then, since what triggered the, this interview – series was Shannon fighting cancer and trying to find the right, what resonated with her and her being a health nut. She really wanted to do natural. She didn't want to do chemo and radiation, which is 
the quote unquote gold standard in America and has been for 70 years, even though it has horrible results and horrible quality of life for the person. That's all we've got. It's the only tool in the toolbox that is sold to us here. How is it? And it's like $21,000 per treatment. And you then there's all the drugs to try to offset the the sickness and stuff that comes from that. So realistically, it's probably more in the twenty two, twenty three thousand dollars per treatment. They people need eight, ten, twelve treatments. And again, this is going to what you were pointing out. This is one of the things that bankrupts families. The number one cause of bankruptcy in the U.S. is medical bills. So in Europe, since you have socialized yeah. medicine, I guess my question is from from your perspective, have you seen this? it worked well for your, your daughter. She was able to get care that she needed. And I guess if you want a certain kind of care, you can pay cash and go get a specialty. Like chiropractic is probably not even covered with insurance over in, in there, if I understand right. So uh, well, private insurance covers it. Uh, some private insurances cover it. Well, that's good. But, that's uh, but if, what about if the- you guys, if you guys were living here, mm-hmm. uh, anybody who's diagnosed with cancer does not pay a penny ever for any health care. Um, for the rest of their lives. I mean, not, for example, if, if a person gets, is something as, as, it's not benign, I guess it could be bad, but if you get skin cancer, which mm-hmm. we know is very treatable and, and whatnot, it's still considered cancer. And from that moment forward, you don't have to have enough to pay any, those minimum co-pays. Wow. Now, you say co-pay to an American and they're like, oh, that's uh, 6,000 bucks before my insurance kicks in. Right. A co-pay here is like, Two bucks, three bucks, ten bucks. You know? so it's like it's crazy. So it's crazy. You know, if, if you guys were living here, Sharon Shannon would be taken care of in but they will they still follow traditional methods. So they follow yes. uh, mainstream medicine, they follow the chemotherapies, etc. Uh, but you also have to realize that because the government's paying, it's it's not they you you discussed something called uh, what you call it heavy chemo or something like that. Or? Well, there's clean chemo that's used outside of the U.S., but regular yeah. chemo is I would call it heavy chemo, but it's just called chemo here. But it's clean chemo outside. Right. Well, I would say they they are veered towards cleaner chemo here because I've had some patients with various types of cancer, breast cancer, uh, mm-hmm. different types of cancer that are being treated here. It still goes through the hair loss. Mm-hmm. Uh, they still feel like crap and the, all the, the negative, some of the negative side effects, but nothing like, like my, I lost my mother, mm-hmm. my father, a brother and a sister to cancer. Wow. So Jay, my, my heart goes out to you, what you're doing and what you're feeling and, and this feeling of helplessness, uh, knowing that there's a better way, but you know, cancer doesn't discriminate. And I've just <laughs> I've had to come to that, make peace with cancer and say, you know, mm-hmm. it doesn't discriminate because I know Shannon's a health freak. She mm-hmm. eats well. She exercises. She's probably one of the healthiest people I know. So it, it, it uh, and I look at my sister was the same way and she had a brain tumor mm. and uh, that did her in within a very short period of time. Uh, my brother, colon cancer, my mother, colon cancer, my father, metastatic bone cancer. And how mm-hmm. desperate I was to find a solution. Whereas the treatment was, the treatment was worse than the disease itself, yes, at least symptomatically. Mm-hmm. And, and please show me, now that I'm educated now on research, show me the data that says that the statistical significance, that this, why is this more significant than doing nothing? Okay, is it going mm-hmm. to prolong their life five more years, 10 more years, 20 more years? What, is the, what are the chances? Yeah. So if they say, well, you got about a 5% chance or 10%, in my opinion, anything less than 50% yeah. a chance of working doesn't justify destroying that person's quality of life, life for the last few years of life that they have. Because mm-hmm. in my personal experience, I've seen everybody just die a miserable, miserable yeah. last few years of their life. Yep. And I commend Shannon and you, and you for making that choice to, to go more natural and see what happens. Yeah. Because I believe the odds are much higher in favor following natural methods than not. Because I've not found research that traditional chemotherapy methods as we know them today, especially in America, are prolonging the survivability of cancer. I know that surgical cases in, in, uh, for example, breast cancer, et cetera, Mm -hmm. has a high success rate. I've seen uh, laser therapies, radiation therapies in prostate is having a much higher success rate. 
but uh, I'm not, I don't know what's going on with cancer, with pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, metastatic cancers, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'm getting a little off path, but it really touches my heartstrings, Dr. J, because yeah. <laughs> I, I literally feel your pain. It's mm -hmm. not about, I just understand though. No, I, I literally viscerally mm -hmm. feel what you guys are going through. So, so so with that system that you have there, if people do, they've got it covered, which is a blessing. That's nice. They've got some coverage there. They're still using the same quote unquote gold standard, similar to what we're using here. Does the healthcare system, the insurance system help cover if you choose to do something outside of the box, like the natural things? Is that covered at all? I don't think it's as absurd as America where, where uh, if you refuse to do traditional, then they, they just kick you off. Now, mm -hmm. if you don't do what we tell you, then forget it. You're not getting anything. Yeah. <laughs> so I know that they do that in California. You know, I, I heard of a little kid with leukemia and the parents didn't want to subject him to the, the chemotherapy. And they said, well, then we're not going to take care of you. You're on your own. Yeah, there's, 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 even no there's even concerns of, oh, then you're not good parents. So we're going to take your kid away. There's a, there are a lot of weird, scary oh, things yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's even more absurd. Yeah. So um, I would say that Portuguese... This Portuguese community, I can't say Portugal's like any other European nation because I find that the Portuguese are extremely humane, ex mm. extremely civilized, extremely loving. Um, even with this whole COVID thing, you know, if you're, if you're positive, the, the GNR, which is the, the national police, it's like a paramilitary group, they go around and they're checking on people. How are you doing? You know, how are you feeling? Do you need anything? They're not putting you in handcuffs and arresting you and throwing you in jail because you were out jogging. And, hey, buddy, wow. you better get home now. Here's a mask. You know, they're very civilized. And, and I'm seeing the U.S. has gone absolutely absurdly berserk. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm so yeah. glad I'm not there. Uh, but I, I, in general, I'd say that they're much more humane in their approach to health care. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, Jay, I, I would have to do more research on on the subject of chemotherapy and cancer in Portugal and make comparisons between the U S statistical results. Mm -hmm. But my heart tells me and my experience tells me what I've witnessed among patients is that it's much more civilized. Mm -hmm. It's much more humane. I don't see the patients suffering as much. Uh, and I see a, a quite a good survival rate using a more conservative chemotherapy approach, though it's the traditional approach. And they don't banish you if you're doing something natural on the side. Gotcha. So I guess that was really what your question was. Yeah. So they, they will say, the doctors that I have spoken with have said, uh, if you feel that it works and you think that it works and it doesn't, it's not contraindicated to the therapy we're giving you, then by all means, go for it. Hmm. So they're not as inhumane as do as I say or you're, you're out of here. So it's... Uh, so people often will mix the two. So they'll, they'll try, say, ketogenic diets. They'll yeah. try many different things. They'll try to decrease, the, change the alkalinity of their, of their blood. They'll do immune-boosting therapies. They'll do whatever they, whatever's out there. There's a million and one things out there that claim to do these things. So they don't say, no, don't do it. But yeah, as a good. standard, as a standard, I don't see them recommending vitamin D and nutrition and sun and exercise and mm -hmm. be happy, smile more, or boost your immunity, yeah. you know, natural ways. I don't see that happening here. Yeah. They're, they're following the purely medical approach. And again, it's, it's, it's driven by, by big pharma mm -hmm. who's making money off of chemotherapy. I mean, if we cured cancer, Jay, we would have this big domino of impact on the big pharma. There's yeah. big money to be made in chemotherapy. And again, that's what I mean when I say, um, just kind of absurd or obscene uh, motives behind the way people are being treated. It's, it's really not humane. And that's where it's interesting because some of the interviews I have lined up here, just to give the listeners a, a little peek, sneak peek, uh, I'm interviewing a, a person that found three years ago, 63 natural cancer fighting physicians disappeared or died in whether, Oh, committed suicide with two bullet holes in the back of the head. It's stuff that's not obviously suicide. They're, they're disappearing inappropriately and dying inappropriately. 63 of them in 18 months for trying to help people naturally fight cancer. And so you start going, well, wait a minute. Some listeners are going to go, Oh, come on. It's conspiracy theory stuff. No, when it, once people we know, and they're, they're dying for just trying to help people because each cancer person, 
uh, or patient that doesn't choose the, the regular route in America is costing big pharma between $250,000 and $500,000, whether they live or die. So there is a, there's a lot of money to be made in this. And then when somebody starts looking at, at people as bottom line, not people, then it's like, hey, you're costing me money. I'm taking you out. I mean, that's, that's, that's how it, that's the scary thing where it's going. Oh, yeah. I mean, on that. One of my interviews, like, sorry, let me just finish with this. One of my interviews is a doctor absolutely. and she's, she is a, she is here in the U.S. treating cancer naturally. She uses the Greek method, which is a very amazing, amazing method we'll talk about in one of our interviews. And she is very gun shy of me interviewing her. She does not want me to show her face. Uh, I had to find her through referrals because she's worried about disappearing for treating people naturally and having the outstanding success rate, like a 95% success rate. Wow. She's the ones she can't seem to help are ones that have brain tumors that are encapsulated, but everything else seems to respond to this technique quite well. And she's, she fears for her life trying to help people fight cancer. It's, it's crazy stuff. Anyway. It's a sad reality, you know, and then they'll throw out conspiracy theorists because what that does, once you hear that, oh, it's like UFOs and everything else, it just credits the person. You know, you're you're watching these scientists and doctors that are coming forward about this whole COVID that Mm -hmm. coming up, you know, Dr. Fauci and all that. Yeah. You know, and they're getting zapped off YouTube and everything else. They're labeled conspiracy theorists theorists and uh, anti-vaxxies and all this stuff. And it's... uh, they throw these labels out. I mean, that's American culture. I mean, everyone's yeah. a racist. Everybody's this. Everybody's that. But that's only the states. I don't see this happening anywhere else. Interesting. Um, yeah, it, it's crazy. But anyway, that, that that could be a whole other hour interview. Yeah. But uh, I sent you a, li- a link to uh, Ted Corin. Did you ever, do you ever look at his stuff? Years ago, I did. I can refresh on that. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I sent you an email. So I would I would take a look at that now. You know, for your sake and for Shannon, and see what he has to say. All right. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hatch, I want to thank you for your time today. It was a great interview. We went down several different rabbit holes that all are tied to health and immunity. And I, I want to thank you for the time, the talents that you've given to your community and to the world community in health and in chiropractic and in nutrition and in ergonomics at work. And to, to take that extra leap to learn to lead, to get your, your doctorate and your PhD to be able to lead more doctors to help more people. I mean, what a great, uh, great reason to do what you do. I sure appreciate you. And thanks for your time today. Well, thank you, Dr. J. I, I have the greatest respect for you and I appreciate that you're taking this time and effort to do this. I know you're going to be editing these things. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're a busy man with a busy clinic and, and a heck of a lot on your plate right now. And so uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's a real honor to do this and be able to share. And, uh, I really appreciate you.